So good morning from Singapore. I see people are dialing in, so I'll be slow in the beginning. Um, thanks for joining and welcome to today's webinar. I'm really uh, excited to launch this uh, paper today together with the, the authors of, the, of this beautiful work on regulatory for digital health. So, um, uh, I mean, you will hear from them later on, so I will not spend too much time in introducing the speakers, but uh, happy to, uh, to welcome uh, Varun from Roche Diagnostics, the John Thornbrough from A-Star, uh, Nate Carrington from Roche Diagnostics, and Manan Hati from Stryker. Uh, and thanks especially to uh, Nate and Manan for joining so late. I know it's evening for you, so thank you. Um, if we can move to the next slide, I just want to uh, mention, as usual, if you have any questions, feel, please feel free to, um, uh, to, to write in the chat, uh, and we will try to answer at the end of the, of the webinar. And then next, um, as, an, as an introduction to this, um, to this um, uh, webinar, just to mention that this is part of the work we do at APAC Med in digital health. Uh, so um, we have a committee that is dedicated to digital health, uh, now uh, embraces um, more than 120 individuals from nearly 50 companies, uh, spanning from MNCs to uh, SMEs and startups, uh, active in the field of uh, medical uh, technology and uh, more specifically digital health. Um, so we have two objectives in the committee uh, that are basically creating and sharing knowledge in this uh, uh, new and very uh, uh, interesting and challenging space uh, of digital health. And the other is, of course, advocating for policies that can enable digital health in our region. So uh, this work is really covering these two objectives, because in, on, on the one side, we wanted to share um, the learnings from, from the industry uh, and uh, our discussion with the regulators and with experts in the digital health field. And on the other side, we also end this, um, uh, this work and this paper uh, by suggesting some uh, recommendations to, um, to the industry and specifically to the, to the regulators. Um, just for your knowledge, we also work on other topics different from regulatory affairs. Uh, cybersecurity, uh, medical device interoperability, and reimbursement and market access, all dedicated to digital health. Feel free to uh, reach out if you want to know more. Um, and uh, that said, I'll hand over to Baron, who will introduce this uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Roberta, for the introduction. My name is Varun Vegas. I am the policy lead for uh, Roche Diagnostics Asia Pacific. I'm also the chair at the Digital Health uh, Committee for the Regulatory Working Group, and it is a pleasure today to be talking to you and launching this position paper, which talks about regulatory best practices and overview of digital health regulation in Asia Pacific. So I would like to really start off uh, with this nice heat map that we have here, which uh, shows uh, aptly the global interest in the regulation of digital health. So of course, United States is really the, the thought process leader in this space, and they have been uh, putting out a lot of regulations, thoughts, and um, even discussion papers around regulations of digital health and artificial intelligence. Uh, Canada is following suit, as well as the European Union, but they have some complexities due to the interpretation of MDR and IVDR related to software and artificial intelligence. Now, what we can really zoom in here is uh, the Asia Pacific region, and you can see uh, Asia Pacific is, is keeping very busy in at least uh, talking about regulations of digital health and also putting out guidances. So China, South Korea, Japan, uh, Australia, Singapore, India, Thailand, Malaysia, all these jurisdictions are interested and in also putting out guidance documents. Now, if we zoom in a little bit, uh, we can see on this slide some of the, the guidelines that have been put out by different countries here in Asia Pacific. I'm not going to go through all of them, but they range everywhere from uh, artificial intelligence to software as a medical device to uh, uh, deep learning uh, as well. So there's, there's a myriad of guidances that are available that have been put out by the regulators in the region. Now, that being said, we, we would like to come back and shift our focus to the, the position paper that, that APAC Med has put together uh, along with uh, a lot of member organizations in the regulatory working group at the Digital Health Committee, and, and I would like to really thank them as well 
for doing a really good job with this position paper. So this position paper is intended to be shared with the regulators with the aim of aiding in creation of fit for purpose regulatory frameworks for digital health across the Asia Pacific region. But of course, we see the use for this position paper even uh, outside Asia Pacific region. So the, the problem statement is the while the current regulations ensure safety and effectiveness of traditional IVDs and medical devices, they do not really fit the fast paced and innovative nature of software and digital health. So in order to really bring safe and effective digital technologies into healthcare at a pace that matches the speed of what's possible and what patients really deserve, we must redesign our regulatory approach to accommodate shorter timelines and iterative nature of software development and digital health solutions. So uh, now I would like to really walk you through the contents of this white paper. Uh, and first we will talk about the overview of digital health regulation in Asia Pacific. This, this, this position paper does a really good job of zooming in on the regulatory controls of three APAC countries, which are also IMDRF markets, Australia, Japan, and Singapore. And as an industry, we came together to, to really look at some of the, the controls which are essential for regulation of digital health and, and which we consider are key. So software qualification, you know, it essentially is uh, talking about whether uh, a software is a medical device or not. Then we talk about software classification. This is finding out what is the risk categorization for a software product. And this is based on two aspects. One is, of course, the state of the healthcare situation, as well as the significance of the information provided to the healthcare de decision by the software product itself. We also look at alternative regulatory pathways, which might be expedited review, recognition and reliance, and, and a few other mechanisms as well. We, we also uh, highlighted that pre-submission consultations are really key uh, for sponsors of digital health technologies, when uh, interfacing with the regulatory agencies. Of course, there has to be considerations for frameworks for regulation of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, and that is also a very uh, interesting and a hot topic. Now, this uh, image shows the best practices and gaps in regulations of the markets that we are talking about in this position paper. So we, we, we are really able to transpose the regulatory controls of Australia, Japan, and Singapore versus the, the, the frameworks I was just talking about. So it gives you a nice overview of how each country is doing when it comes to say qualification or risk classification or alternative pathways or pre-submission consultation or even frameworks for artificial intelligence and machine learning. So I'll give, I will not talk about each of these. What I will really try to you know, uh, give you an example is if we zoom into the risk classification space, we see that you know, the, the regulatory agencies, even though they are IMDRF economies, they, they are IMDRF members, they do not really harmonize with IMDRF's recommendations in the N12 guidance for regulation of software. So this is an area for us to work with regulators and you know, work with APAC Med to advocate for harmonization in this space. This paper also does a really good job of uh, recognizing and really highlighting some of the cutting edge controls that the United States FDA has put forth for regulating digital health. Um, it, it also gives a description of US FDA's best practices and gaps while regulating software. It also gives a very nice overview of the US FDA pre-certification pilot program, as well as some of the approaches US FDA is recommending for regulation of artificial intelligence and machine learning, which you can see on the screen. And this is more, mostly about predetermined change control plans. Now, we also have two wonderful use cases where we spoke to uh, two SME organizations. One was Pair Therapeutics and, and Digital Diagnostics. And, and during our interviews with them, we, we really uh, understood that what might be helpful for a small to medium enterprise while, while trying to go to market with their digital solutions and interfacing with regulatory agencies. So, you know, the, the, the theme was that there has to be a collaborative space with the regulators, as well as uh, room for some cutting edge controls, which are really fit for purpose for digital solutions like predetermined change control plans. Now, uh, this, this paper really uh, does a great job at, at recommending a best practice framework 
uh, which is really an outline for health authorities when trying to regulate digital health solutions. And it has three fundamental buckets. So it looks at uh, the fundamental building blocks for a software focused regulatory framework, which essentially talks about the first thing that a regulator should really do is implement a clearly described approach to software qualification, which I said was determining when a software is a medical device versus not. So what this will really enable is that health authorities can focus their precious resources on uh, you know, software functions that really pose a risk to say patient safety. And, and this approach should leverage international best practices in, from other jurisdictions like the US, Canada, from our region, Australia does a really good job. Now, it is very important to create a risk-based fit for purpose risk categorization or a classification framework that is SAMD specific. It is very important that it does not leverage the existing classification schemes developed for traditional medical devices and IVDs. What, what really happens is software products get upclassified and that is burdensome, not just for sponsors of technology, but you know other players in the ecosystem like startups and SMEs. And the recommendation in our position paper is to really align with IMDRF's N12 risk categorization framework. And specifically Japan, Singapore and Australia have work to do in, in terms of aligning with the recommendations of the N12 guidance. We also touch upon uh, the concept of multiple functions where we, we are really recommending that the regulators implement policies by which the health authorities only exercise regulatory oversight over those functions that have a medical device intended use. So the, the simple example is the Apple Watch. So while the Apple Watch itself, the hardware is a consumer product, the ECG app is a regulated SAMD. Now, the next bucket that we really recommend to the regulators is pathways to support rapid regulatory reviews of these products, as well as the change modifications. Uh, now, the first piece that we, we really dive in on is implementation of recognition and reliance models. And, and what this really enables is uh, making use of regulatory assessments from comparable overseas regulators when conducting you know, pre-market reviews for uh, a digital health solution. Now, what this really does is it, it enables uh, regulators to leverage resources from, from other, other regulatory agencies as well. And this can really support rapid regulatory reviews of these uh, niche products. Also, what we have seen is uh, it is important to streamline regulatory pathways for introduction of SAMD products and their modifications. So what we, what we see is a, a lot of jurisdictions like Singapore, Japan, the United States have mechanisms for expedited review pathways. Um, and also they are putting in controls uh, which really look at appropriate regulation of modifications for digital health solutions. So one, one of the controls that we see uh, being used in the United States as well as Japan is the whole concept of predetermined change control plans. And, and this is also a recommendation in, in our position paper. Now, uh, we also recommend in this position paper unique regulatory approaches, which are tailored for the iterative nature of SAMD that are leveraging artificial intelligence or machine learning. So I think that is always an important concept. There are certain regulatory approaches that must be built, which are more unique to AI or machine learning. The, the last uh, bucket, of our best practices framework focuses on collaboration and convergence opportunities in the Asia Pacific region. So in order to support the digital health regulatory global convergence, we have to look at recognition and adoption of internationally recognized guidance documents and standards, such as those developed by IMDRF and ISO. So we, we see sometimes uh, in the region that there are jurisdictions and, and regulatory agencies that have a knack for developing local standards, um, and which we feel is an additional burden for, for sponsors of these technologies. Uh, and, and our recommendation really is to adopt internationally recognized standards that already exist. The, the other recommendation is that we should collaborate with regulatory agencies, should collaborate with software developers through pre-submission consultation. So when we spoke to Pair Therapeutics, 
they were really thankful for the experience that they, they went through with HSA because they had access to HSA through pre-submission consultations and it really helped them uh, bring their product to market faster. Now, the, the other space that we really see is the, the space for the industry associations, consortiums to, to partner with the regulator as well as the industry. And this is really to uh, foster that, that whole collaborative space that will really evolve the digital health regulatory landscape to the next level. And this will really enable safe, effective, effective and timely delivery of innovative solutions that will ultimately benefit patients and healthcare professionals. And with that, uh, I am at the end of my presentation and I would like to stop sharing my screen and we will go into a panel discussion. So with this, I would like to uh, first introduce to you uh, Nate Carrington from Roche Diagnostics. Nate, would you like to introduce yourself before we break into a conversation? Sure. Thanks, Varun. Thanks very much for that overview of the paper and good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to speak with you all today. Uh, my name is Nate Carrington. I'm head of uh, digital health and innovation for our global regulatory policy uh, and intelligence team. Uh, for Roche Diagnostics, uh, located in Indianapolis. Thank you, Nate. Uh, our, our next uh, panelist is John Richard Thornback from uh, uh, Diagno DXD. So John, would you like to uh, introduce yourself? Hi, I'm not, not used to be called John Richard. It's kind of confused me. I, <laughs> I forgot that the middle name. Anyway, uh, I'm John Thornback. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the Diagnostics Development Hub here in Singapore. Um, DXD Hub is a, a governmental body which is established to really facilitate and to help to grow um, the diagnostics industry uh, within Singapore and also with a remit uh, within the Asian area as well. Thank you very much, John. Um, Manan Hathi from Stryker, he, he, he has been a pillar of support for this uh, position paper as well. So Manan, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, Warren, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Manan Hathi. Uh, uh, I'm a global process owner for digital health uh, regulatory processes at Stryker, and I'm based in uh, Flower Mound, Texas. So, mm -hmm. very happy. thank you very much, Manan. And I would also like Roberta to introduce herself again because she is also one of our panelists for our chat. Thank you. And I just realized my photo doesn't appear in the first slide. I forgot <laughs> about myself. Uh, thanks, Varun. So I'm, I'm Roberta. I manage the Digital Health Committee at APAC Med. Um, so yeah, I mean, it has been a very beautiful journey so far. So I'm very uh, proud and happy to, uh, to be here now. I mean, if I think about last September, we were at the beginning of this work and now we are uh, sharing it with, uh, with the community. So it's really a, a nice uh, thing for, for, for APAC Med. Thanks. Great. Thank you. And thank you very much, Roberta, for creating this collaborative space in the regulatory committee where, you know, uh, all the member organizations could really come together, put their heads together and put out this really solid uh, body of work, which will go a long way uh, in the region, especially as a resource for regulators to uh, really reimagine their regulatory frameworks for digital health solutions. Uh, so maybe now I have a few questions and I can, uh, first, uh, I will ask a question to Nate. So Nate, what do you think? Are the current regulatory frameworks well suited for these emerging digital health technologies and solutions? Yeah, I think that's an excellent uh, question, Varun, and, and really speaks to the motivation for, for writing this, this position paper. When you, when you think about existing regulatory frameworks that have been developed. They've really been developed for traditional medical devices and in vitro diagnostic devices. And while certainly these frameworks are capable of ensuring safety and effectiveness for these types of products, they're really not well suited for the unique and iterative aspect of software as a medical device uh, products. If you think about some of the differences of software versus traditional medical devices and IVDs, software is a virtual product versus your traditional devices are, are hardware based. Uh, you also have different logistical channels, for example, with respect to your software products. They can be downloaded via the cloud, for example. Also for software products, they're expected to change often 
consumers expect to be able to update software frequently to have new features and functionality. And that rate of change often outpaces what we would typically see for hardware medical devices and IVDs. And so when we think about you know, those unique aspects and kind of look at them in the consideration of existing regulatory frameworks, we say, well, there are some pretty big, big gaps here. Most regulatory frameworks are classification systems, as you mentioned in your overview, Faroon, have been developed for traditional devices and IVDs and don't really fit with, with software. I think another key challenge area is with respect to change management. You know, change management for medical devices in IVDs is typically very slow and very burdensome. And so we really have to rethink that model in the context of software products that are intended to update uh, frequently. So regulators are starting to think along these lines, starting to think about more fit for purpose regulatory frameworks. And we have some good examples, I think, in the position paper. But we've got more work to do here to really ensure that we have safe and effective uh, technologies that can get out to the patients and healthcare professionals, but also in a timely and efficient manner. And so that is really, I think, the overall goal when we think about reimagining regulatory frameworks, specifically in the context of software as a medical device. Great. Thank you so much, Nate. So I think uh, the, the key over here is to really reimagine our regulatory frameworks. And building off that, I have a question for John. So John, uh, when we think about reimagining our regulatory frameworks, do you feel that jurisdictions in Asia Pacific are ready for these type of technologies? And do you see gaps in capacities of countries, uh, even regulators being better positioned for regulating innovative digital health solutions? John, I think you're on mute. Sorry, school boy error. Um, I think we were very encouraged when we went through the present when we went through the data that there was a, a definite move with the regulators to discuss um, and to interact with the industry and with the before and it's the pre um, submission consultations which is which is very important and that's something which you know we've seen now in in this in this region. Um, as being in all the all three of the the, the jurisdictions we talked to, um, they were very active in that, especially in Singapore, where the where the, where the HSA are very active. Um, what we're um, in, and that is a very encouraging situation because that shows that the, the regulators are beginning to interact and to understand the challenges of new of the the new paradigms with of the uh, Sandy. I think that um, also that what we um, identified was that there are different that the challenges I think are um, that we identified in particular was the delivery systems as Nate has said for SAMD are um, very different from the uh, those of a traditional IVD in a controlled environment. You know, we are uh, one of the um, things that we identify in the in the paper is the software where it's going into multifunctional devices and how that is going to be regulated in the, in the future and, and coming to a consensus of how that is, is, is um, going to be developed going forward. And I think that because everybody now has a, a mobile phone um, and everybody has a well, some kind of wellness app on that mobile phone, but how does that translate to SAMD? How, does that, how can that be applied to um, medical device situations within hospitals and then within GP clinics. I think that um, that whole issue is, is one that um, where there is where there needs to be development, um, which we saw as a, as a, as a gap with it when we were looking at the position mm -hmm. paper. Um, we're very encouraged that um, you know the, the regulators do have a lot of forums um, which, where they talk to each other and I think it's, it's very important for them. and we are seeing that in certainly in the ASEAN area. I mean, um, um, DXD is involved in an ASEAN DX um, initiative, where we get regular, where we get um, senior members from all over the ASEAN countries to sponsored by the by the government um, to meet together to discuss um, you know how to develop um, develop diagnostics and SAMD within within the um, ASEAN area, and so we are very encouraged by the fact that there is this interaction with regulators. But there's more to do. I think what we've identified in the paper is that you know the risk classification is one of the key things that we where we need we need clarification and standardization, but also 
the different delivery systems, which are peculiar to, which will help those countries in, in APAC, especially the not very developed countries, they will sudden, certainly suddenly have access through that, those, those technologies which they never had before. How can they be applied safely? Um, how can SAMD be applied safely within those devices? And I think that's the key going forward. Thank you very much, John. So I think my key takeaways from your um, um, response was we are encouraged, but there's more to do. So my next question will be for Roberta. So you have been involved on, on both sides of this table, right? So you, 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 we have worked together as an industry crafting this position paper, but you've also interacted uh, on multiple occasions with regulatory agencies. So my question is from an industry perspective, from an industry body perspective, how should we, we create a shift or what needs to change? Yeah, thank you Varun for this question. And um, I think if we look at this paper, so this paper is really the result of a dialogue among different manufacturers or more broadly digital health developers, right? So it's the industry that comes together to share, to learn, and then to suggest something that can promote you know, optimization of the current uh, protocols. Uh, but more than the industry uh, manufacturers, I think what was important in this work uh, was to um, uh, interact with other stakeholders as well, right? Other external digital health experts, companies, the regulators, and so on. So um, I think it's this idea of ecosystem and collaboration. And I, I hear that a lot during your, I mean, your, your presentation. So collaboration and sharing and discussing with the regulators and open dialogue. I think that's really important. And from an APAC perspective, we want to encourage and to support as well this dialogue. So we are very happy to uh, provide the platform for that to happen. Um, so I think that's one point. And then the, uh, just to, to show an example, a concrete example, and uh, you also mentioned that during your presentation. So when we discuss with one of the organization um, uh, that we reviewed in the paper, right? Uh, we were uh, trying to understand what was their uh, experience when they get to, um, um, uh, the, when they get their uh, digital health um, uh, solution approved in Singapore. And actually it was Per Therapeutics was the first uh, digital therapeutics to be approved in, in this country. And one of the, the key success factors that they mentioned was uh, the collaboration and the dialogue with the regulator in Singapore. So I think this dialogue is really important. This is a, a new and a very rapidly evolving space. So I think that's it's really important for manufacturers to discuss with uh, regulators and uh, you know, share with them how the software was developed, how it's going to be used, and well, vice versa, the, man the regulators should also uh, explain and discuss with manufacturers to, you know, to highlight what are the requirements that they need to prove safety, uh, effectiveness, and then uh, uh, patient outcomes. Great, thank you so much, Roberta. And I think, yes, we, we all agree that we need to create a much more collaborative space which fosters dialogue at the end of the day, not just between uh, say, say industry, but also industry, industry bodies and regulators. And, and with that, I would like to ask my next question to Manan. So now we will get a little bit into the weeds of this position paper. So uh, the two very important and foundational controls that we have spoken about in this position paper are appropriate qualification of software, as well as risk-based uh, risk classification of software products, right? And then we also look at the three IMDRF markets, Japan, Australia, and Singapore. Manan, how do you think they do when it comes to qualification and risk categorization of software products? That's a great question, Warren. And uh, so just to level set everybody, as we saw in the slides, the qualification is the act of determining whether a given software meets the definition of a medical device and should be regulated, versus classification is, uh, determines the risk based tier that a uh, uh, regulatory paradigm should be tailored towards based on the risk of the software. So when we talk of qualification, um, you know, in the different regions, I would start with Australia because they are the farthest along. And uh, the PGA has published a consultation on scope of regulated software-based products. Uh, although it is a draft right now, it does a pretty good job of establishing a risk-based approach to software qualification. You know, 
they go so far as to exclude or exempt uh, lower risk software from uh, regulatory oversight. This would include um, ele uh, electronic patient records or software that's used for clinical workflow, and even some low risk CDS software as well. Uh, it's very much aligned with, uh, with global regulations such as uh, US and Canada. Uh, when we go to Japan, they do cover qualification in their uh, CND notification number 1114-5. However, uh, it, they do mostly align with global best practices, but it, they lack some clarity according to uh, particularly accounting for the low-risk clinical decision support software, unlike TGA. Um, Singapore, uh, again, it, they do have some guidelines that address specific technologies such as telemedicine and to some extent, uh, how do those uh, uh, fall within reg regulated versus non-regulated, but uh, it doesn't provide sufficient detail uh, to guide qualifications. So I think uh, that patients, regulators, and industry alike would benefit from more robust guidelines. Uh, that covers such things as uh, low-risk CDS and low-risk laboratory information system software. So switching gears to classification, to the second part of the question, uh, really the global standard for classification of software is this IMDRF risk-based framework you alluded to and is very well explained in the position paper. Um, uh, however, all three countries are lacking to some degree and they need, they need some work to align with the NDRF and the global regulations. So uh, just to give a highlight, Australia uh, framework does take into account the state of the healthcare condition or situation, but does not fully account for the significance of information provided. Um, uh, similarly, Japan and Singapore, they really rely on their existing medical device regulatory frameworks. Um, that do take into account the state of healthcare condition, but don't really take into account the significance of information provided. Uh, what's interesting is uh, for Singapore, when you, they look at what level of clinical evidence is required for SAMD, they do follow the IMDRS framework for, for that, both from state of healthcare situation as well as significance of information, which is very welcome, but it would be, it would benefit everyone framework was fully adopted even for classification. Uh, Great, thank you so much, Manan. I think, um, yeah, and also a little birdie told me that the two other uh, jurisdictions in Asia Pacific, which we did not reference in this position paper, China and Korea, also do not do very well in that risk categorization space, right? So there's a lot of work to be done in this space not just here in APAC, but globally, but very well, thank you. And for my next question, Nate, you know, we, we also spoke about some alternative pathways in my presentation, uh, which you also helped develop in this position paper, the, the whole storyline, right? So recognition and reliance, expedited review routes, predetermined change control plans. So these are all uh, uh, very well articulated in this position paper. So can you really explain or, or elaborate on how Singapore, Australia, and Japan does in this alternative pathway space. Yeah, for sure. You know, I, I think one of the things the paper highlights is that there are many options that regulatory authorities have at their disposal to support speed of innovation in this area and support clearance or approval of safe and effective software products, but doing it in a timely and efficient manner. And you know, I think the, the different countries, the three different countries that we evaluated in this position paper have some, some unique and some good, good approaches here. I, I think TGA, for example, um, has, does a lot of work around recognition and reliance, right? So they have mutual recognition agreements in place with, with certain regions or areas, for example, with the EU, with notified bodies. And so that they, they are, are able to leverage uh, clearances or approvals that have occurred in the EU for uh, products that are wish to be commercialized in, in Australia. Similarly, we see with Singapore some a really excellent, I think, recognition and reliance uh, approach. You know, they have approaches to um, uh, abridged evaluation routes. They also have immediate, immediate uh, uh, recognition uh, routes. And so I think there are some very good approaches that Singapore is using. And I, I, in fact, Singapore even has some, some recognition and reliance models specifically for software products. So they've even taken their recognition and reliance uh, aspects a step further 
created some uh, dedicated recognition approaches specifically for software. So I think they certainly should be uh, commended uh, for that for that there. You know, one other area I think of, of interest for Singapore as well as they've issued a draft guidance on artificial intelligence and machine learning. We talked about the importance uh, of having maybe some unique perspectives on that. And in, in that draft guidance, they talk a little bit about the use of synthetic data for uh, AI machine learning based software product development and commercialization. And it's actually one of the few regulators that I've seen actually take uh, a concept like machine learning and, and talk about how it can actually be applied uh, for regulatory decision making. So I think that, you know, I, I, it's very positive. I think they're doing some forward looking uh, things there as well. And then we have Japan, which I think is really taking some unique approaches for uh, devices in general, uh, but including software. You know, they have what is called a Sakagaki designation uh, track, which is really meant to streamline review pathways uh, to enable quicker review times, quicker review cycles, and, and getting products to market more quickly. And then they also have a, a concept called uh, IDATIN, which is really a, a concept of previewing changes uh, with, with MHLW ahead of time um, before products uh, are, are launched on the market and then rolling out those changes post-market according to agreed upon process. Uh, basically during a pre-market review, a, a, a developer would, would approach MHLW with what they would call an improvement process that would explain once the product is launched, how they would plan to improve that product. And once the product is approved, that improvement process is also approved and so the developer can roll out changes according to that improvement process um, post-market without having to continually go back for pre-market review, which of course can be very lengthy and delay the implementation of uh, helpful uh, and important updates with increased functionality. And so that type of model, you know, you, you know kind of pre-approving changes uh, for a software product ahead of time, you know, really has significant advantages for software products, which as we talked about can benefit from some unique and iterative uh, or from some unique regulatory approaches that really support their iterative nature. Um, that IDATIN approach that I mentioned is actually applicable to all medical devices in Japan. It's not just to software products, but Japan has specifically recognized the value that it brings for software products and particularly AI-based software products because they've created a special version of that, of, uh, that concept called IDATIN AI. So clearly such an approach really can benefit even continuous learning AI systems to, to really identify how they can improve in, in the future. So, you know, I think overall, there's some really good alternative pathways that are described in, in, this, um, uh, in this position paper of, of, that these different countries do employ. I think where we really could see, you know, some countries like Australia and Singapore uh, benefit from is, you know, more increased focus on change management, you know, and, and how to address uh, changes in a more expeditious manner for, for software products. I think that's one thing we, we saw in Japan where there's some unique approaches with IDATIN. And that's something that, you know, um, uh, Australia, Singapore could benefit from, and of course, many other countries in the Asia Pacific region as well. Great, thank you, Nate. So I think overall, when we look at at least the alternative pathway space, I think Asia Pacific is doing much better than it does in the risk categorization space. So I think that's encouraging, like John said. Now, it will only be right that we also speak about the US FDA now, right? Uh, because we have also uh, articulated about a lot of regulatory controls and conversations that are happening at the United States FDA. So Manan, my, my question would be to you, right? So the, the position paper really highlights some of the innovative regulatory approaches that the US FDA has discussed and which are also being pursued to address the unique and iterative aspects of SAMD. Can you briefly talk about some of these approaches? Absolutely. So uh, there are really two that come to mind, right? And that and we, the paper does a great job of detailing them. And one is the pre-certification pilot program. That's really geared towards uh, how SAMD is different from a traditional nuts and bolts medical device in the, in the sense that, as you mentioned, it's highly iterative. Uh, so what a pre cert pilot at a high level does is it's sort of a, uh, think of it like a background check on, on your device, right? So you, you, get, you go through a excellence appraisal with the FDA, which uh, will rate your software development practices from a, on a five point scale of uh, uh, culture of quality and organizational excellence principles. 
And then based on where you come out on that, if you're pre-certified, then you have better options from when you go into your uh, uh, pre-market review, you would have a shorter time, such as similar to the Saki Gaki framework, it would be sort of a uh, shortened review time that FDA would take that otherwise they would have taken for a traditional submission. Um, and then also, uh, you know, uh, it would also be that you would be able to do um, certain changes to the software once it's on the market um, without needing a, a full submission uh, that, that otherwise would have been required. Um, and then uh, it has other elements such as uh, um, uh, real world performance monitoring that just goes back and uh, keeps it keeps a tab on are you maintaining your software development practices uh, and what have you. Um, the other aspect I would mention is the specific framework that uh, FDA has uh, sort of discussed in a white paper uh, is the AIML framework. They've also published an action plan on this, um, but uh, it, the AIML framework is, is uh, loosely sort of structured around the pre-serve pilot except the excellence, I wouldn't say loosely, it's really structured around the preset pilot where the excellence appraisal would take into account good machine learning practices if you're doing AI. And, uh, uh, and then you still have the, uh, the streamlined review process, except the streamlined review process would also include sort of the predetermined change protocol that Nate was talking about, uh, where the, you would establish your uh, pre-specifications for the software uh, determine what it's intended to do and also an acceptance change protocol, uh, very similar to the improvement plan that we were talking about. So uh, once you've gone through that, then uh, you know any changes uh, that happen to the AI in the field, um, you would first go back and look, is it within my established SPS and ACP? And if that's a yes, I can just do those changes without uh, having to go back to the agency. And even if actually do have to go back to the agency. Sometimes it may just be a simple uh, re-review or a focused re-review of the SPS and the ACP to expand the boundaries rather than for a full five minute submission. Um, so yeah, FDA has really taken uh, uh, note that you know software is iterative and particularly AIML software is even more so. And uh, the traditional approach of uh, regulating nuts and bolts medical devices doesn't really fit when you're trying to regulate uh, something like software and EIMR. So I really recommend uh, read the paper to find the detailed descriptions of these frameworks. Absolutely, I recommend that too, Manan, and thank you very much. And the the one thing that stands out to me, Manan, when you know you you describe the approaches that the US FDA is taking is really the benefit. Uh, that can be realized for startups and small to medium enterprises with, with this kind of a regulatory paradigm, right? With these possibilities of expedited reviews, when they are looking at culture of quality and organizational excellence. I mean, these are certain areas that startups and SMEs can really benefit from. And with that, I would go to my next question to John. So John, we interviewed Bear Therapeutics. It's a, it's a SME organization for featuring the product that is called Reset. It is, I believe, the first digital therapeutic product that has been approved by the US FDA as well as HSA Singapore. So when we spoke to them, what stood out to you in our conversation with Bear Therapeutics, especially from the needs of a small to medium enterprise yeah. or a startup when engaging with a regulatory body? Okay. Thank you, Varun. I mean, having run some startups, I can um, say I wish I had the view that, I wish I had the clear vision that um, Pear obviously had. Um, I think the, the, the key message for me was they had a clear view from day one that they wanted a therapeutic indication. Mm -hmm. And their focus was then, how do we adapt and, and modify the um, way of developing a therapeutic to a software-based product rather than a physical product? And I think that was the, and, and they knew that they, had, they wanted um, a therapeutic indication, which was, you know, increased, for instance, they increased the abstinence rate within the substance use disorder patients, right? So that's a, ther a therapeutic indication that they could claim, right? So the question was, how can they do that? Um, so if you take the, the basics of, uh, of drug development and say, okay, preclinical development, what did they do? 
that, that took the concept of preclinical development and put it into a SAMD space, right? And basically, it's, it's no, it's, to me, it's no coincidence that they were one of, the, they were an SME that was part of the preset program. Mm -hmm. that, that, you know, they were able to leverage, I'm sure, all the, all the expertise from the FDA and all the inspections they had to actually really translate the concept of preclinical development into the digital therapeutic space. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, the second part of that is the, the clinical development process. And they were, they were clear to us that um, what they did was they did not think of it as a medical device. They thought about their clinical development program as in terms of a therapeutic and, and working towards a therapeutic indication. And I think that, that clear vision was the thing that came out for me. And that's something which I think all SMAD, SAMD should do. You know, think If you're going to develop a digital therapeutic, think what you want in the first place, think how you adapt and use that roadmap Pair said to themselves it was quite an arduous process to get the FDA to really think through the differences and how it could be applied. But there is now a roadmap for other companies now that can go down that route. And actually, that was a very, that was, that to me, that clarity of vision and the ability to adapt the drug development pro paradigm to a digital therapeutic was really a very interesting part of the discussion. And I learned a lot from it, but that's not. Great. Thank you so much, John. I think that is insightful. And I think I was also there for that uh, interview. And what also stood out to me personally was, you know, Yuri's ask, who is, I believe, the chief medical officer, his ask for a, uh, an open dialogue with industries as well. And then he also appreciated and lauded uh, the the level of collaboration that, you know, HSA usually has with the, with the industry. So I think that was something that really stood out to me. And with that, Roberta, I will come to you with a question, right? So now we have this really um, good body of work. We have this position paper. So going forward, how do we take our collaboration with the regulators to the, the next level? And how do we create this open dialogue that we have been speaking about for best practice sharing to evolve the regulations of digital health solutions in Asia Pacific? Have you considered using this position paper to build a capacity building programs that can be targeted towards regulators as well as industry, startups, SMEs? Yeah, thanks a lot, Varun. And I think this is really um, important as a first step. And you, you, you highlighted that, right? So we created a piece of knowledge. This is just the first step of uh, a, a bigger project. So. Um, now, what will be important is and, and crucial for APAC Med uh, and all the members who contributed to this work is how do we bring this work into the countries and how do we activate the knowledge in the countries in order to build capacity within the regulator community and also the, the, the companies, the manufacturers and the digital health developers. So there are two aspects. So the first one is if we focus on the regulator, the regulators, uh, there is something that we can do, of course, from an APAC Med perspective. We already have a relationship with some of them. Um, with Australia and Singapore, it's probably more advanced. With uh, Japan, we need to work more. So, of course, it, it's not something that will happen overnight, right? But we need to start uh, interacting more um, uh, closely and deeply on the content of this paper, trying to understand as well, because, I mean, this was, a, a, we reviewed three countries and then we, we included the US FDA and we tried to be general because our final uh, objective is to harmonize. But then when we go to the country, we need to understand the specificities of the countries. And we know that, for example, Singapore, Australia, Japan, they are doing well on some aspect. Uh, do they need our support on other aspects? Can we facilitate this dialogue and this discussion? I think that's where uh, our work will focus this year. So um, uh, yes, we, we have considered to uh, establish some capacity building programs for the regulators. Uh, we will start with, you know, with some priorities this year, and we hope that if things go, go well, then we can uh, replicate these initiatives in other countries as well. And then the, the second piece of your question is around the companies, right, the digital health 
uh, developers or more traditional uh, medical device uh, manufacturers. So even there, what we see, uh, you know, discussing with uh, several uh, uh, medical device uh, manufacturers and also across a very diverse region is that in this space, uh, digital health and more specifically um, uh, SAMD, not everyone is on the same page. So our role is also, can we share the knowledge? Can we create a community where everyone can benefit of the knowledge of each other? And then we can move together as an industry. I think this is something that will come as well. Great, thank you, Robert. I think that is, uh, yeah, that's a very clear roadmap, but okay, let me challenge you a little bit. Let me probe you a little bit more specifically about the regulators, right? So uh, or what would be APAC Med's uh, plans to engage directly with HSA Singapore, TGA Australia and NPMDA Japan? Because you, you said, we see that there are spaces where we really need to applaud these regulators, right? They have done a tremendous job and I would, put my neck out and say that some of these regulators in Asia Pacific are much more advanced than some of the regulators in the West. Yeah. So we all can agree to that. And they are deploying cutting edge controls to, you know, really look at appropriately regulating digital solutions, especially HSA Singapore. Yeah. Japan is not, not doing uh, really bad either. So now the, the whole idea is Roberta, like, in, in order to maximize the impact of this position paper, what are your concrete plans with HSA, TGA, and PMDA? Okay, I know you want to know my you know, next steps clearly and share with the community. I think it's, it's nice and it's very important to share this sense of urgency and also, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the concrete plans. So what we have taught for 2021 in terms of activation in country um, is basically around two main initiatives. So one is more general. How can we share the, the content of our paper and start this dialogue um, with the regulators? Um, and uh, to answer these first questions, we are uh, this first question, we are going to organize a round table actually in one month. So it's happening very soon. Um, uh, we, we, organ we will organize this roundtable with the support of IMS uh, uh, that is, you know, uh, facilitating the whole process. And the idea is bringing regulators from the IMDRF countries uh, around the table to start discussing, right? So some of them, are, they are more aware of the work we do. Uh, they, they reviewed our paper, some others, they, they don't, right? So uh, the first step is always discussing and sharing. Then. More concretely, what can we do? So um, we prioritized as a group, one country, it's Singapore, and um, we will start with a, a program uh, co-built with Singapore, and um, we will collaborate, of course, we will continue this collaboration with John from um, uh, DXD, and then we will also involve uh, CORE, uh, the Center of, Excel, of Regulatory Excellence from, from um, uh, Duke uh, University. So we will build a program together with the HSA to uh, start a discussion and bring the content of the paper into the Singapore context. As we many times they are doing very well on many different aspects is there something that we can do to optimize even more the way they are looking at digital health regulation so it will be very easy you know uh, I, we are thinking about two to three working session across across the year and then coming up with a um, with a tailored roadmap for 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 the regulator in singapore and when I said we focus on Singapore uh, and not on other countries, bear with us, it's only a question of resources. We want to do more, but we also have to be you know, realistic. So we will start with Singapore, Australia and Japan. They are also on our uh, top priority list. We will activate the discussion in other ways, probably you know, starting to engage with them with closed door round table, with discussion with the, with the regulators and the local association. So we have several ways we can activate the, count, the, the content in country. And then uh, once we will, I think already, you know, the objective of building capabilities this year will be very important. It will take time. If we can manage to do that, I think it will be already great by the end of 2021. And then we will be probably ready for our next step that is really, you know, uh, advocating shaping the policy all together as an industry uh, and ecosystem beyond the industry as well. I hope I answered your question, but okay, you, did. you did, and I'm really happy. Thank you very much, because I, I really feel that you know uh, that that plan with HSA is really good. Uh, the HSA and Singapore really take pride in some of their regulatory controls, and for very good reason. 
And the fact that they are also open to such a, a dialogue with the industry, APAC, Medcore, DXD, speaks volumes about their willingness really to, uh, you know, sit across the table from the industry and, and really discuss, you know, what, what will it take to take their regulatory controls to the next level. And, and you know, all our con conversations with HSA, with Dr. Rama, and, you know, the whole digital health team have not been nothing but encouraging. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. And, and I really hope that, you know, we can also, with building off this momentum, we can really work with TGA and PMDA as well. And they can also realize the, the, the benefits of, you know, co co collaborating and co-creating this future for digital health regulations in Asia Pacific. With that, I'm at the end of my questions, but I do see that there's a question in the chat from Roy Chen. So the question is, more and more data governance, privacy and cybersecurity laws and regulations have been impacted, have impacted the digital solution development and deployment. Did this report analyze this impact to digital health or will this impact be considered in the next version? So maybe I can take a first stab and then anyone can uh, really, really go ahead. So, so Roy, uh, in this, in this position paper, the, the focus really was SAMD regulations, and we were mostly focused on the, the regulatory controls from a pre-market and post-market perspective. We did not really do a deep dive into, say, data governance, privacy, or cybersecurity. But that being said, you know, the cybersecurity working group is already very active, and they have put out some really good uh, deliverables looking at cybersecurity laws and regulation that have implications in this space. And apart from that, we are also kickstarting kick uh, a project on data where, where we will be looking at some of the aspects of you know, data residency laws, cross-border data flows, and how this will really enable the, the, the endpoint for you know, regulations, right? So which is real world evidence. So real world evidence for regulatory decision-making as well as reimbursement. Roberta, anyone else would like to add anything? Yeah, I was uh, right oh, sorry. chat. Sorry, Nate. Just uh, so uh, Roy and uh, all the APAC Med members on the webinar now, if you are interested in joining this health data um, um, project, we are uh, king, we are um, uh, starting next week. So I mean, please feel free to get back to me. I, I will be more than happy to provide more details. Nate, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I, thanks, uh, Roberta and Varun. I think you gave an excellent answer. I was just going to add that I, I think the the posi this position paper focused specifically on software as a medical device, where I think a lot of the points you brought up are, are very important to software as a medical device, but they're actually also very important to traditional medical devices and IBDs as, as well. Basically, anything that can connect to a, a network, uh, you know, there's potential for cybersecurity threats and vulnerabilities and considerations around data privacy issues as well as around data governance. So, um, you know, I, those topics certainly are important in the context of software as a medical device, but they also, I think, are important in the context of your traditional devices and, and IBDs as well. Great, thank you so much, Roberta and Nate. And we have another question from Casey Wong. Uh, would it be beneficial to bring this position paper and discussion at AMDC? That's the ASEAN Medical Device Committee. And I think that's a fantastic idea too. Um, at the end of the day, you know, Singapore usually is the torch bearer or, or the shining tower country at, at the AMDC table. And I think this will go also a long way in you know, facilitating that, that, that recognition and reliance conversation at, at AMDC. So I think, Roberta, this is a really good recommendation from Casey Wong, and maybe we can look into it as well. Yeah, I totally agree. Thanks a lot for the suggestion. I think, yeah, definitely we can uh, we can do that. Um, so uh, I think we are uh, perfectly on time. One minute left. Let me thank all the members of the Digital Health Regulatory Working Group um, for being supportive uh, last year. Uh, and, and I mean, you, you, you really uh, made a difference. Let me thank all the panelists today um, on this webinar uh, for, uh, you know, for your work, engagement, for all the, you know, the writing and the revision and the interview with the people with the uh, different stakeholders. So thanks a lot for all the support. Uh, and I look forward to uh, the activation in country and to see what impact can we have. Uh, so with that said, uh, have a nice day and evening according to the time zone. Uh, thank you and see you at the next webinar. Bye.
Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you.